Praise the Lord. If you'll stand with me this morning. Psalms 150 declares to praise God in his sanctuary. To praise him in the fervent of his power. To praise him for his mighty acts. To praise him according to his excellent greatness. To praise him on the psaltery and the harp. In the, on the stringed instruments and the organs and even in the tremble and the dance to praise him on the high sounding cymbals to praise him on the loud sounding cymbals to let everything that hath breath praise the Lord and I don't know about you this morning but as I walk into this sanctuary and I sing these songs and I look back over my shoulder and I look at where God has brought me from I can truly say this morning on behalf of Shea Hughes if it had not been for the Lord on my side where would I be this morning? Is there anybody in here besides me that you can look over your shoulder at that moment in your life that you know, that you know, that you know? That if it had not been for God stepping in at the last minute, and this morning we echo the words of David who said, I was young one time and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seat out begging for bread. And I want you to know this morning, I am just so excited to be here this morning. Uh, Abigail and I had a rare free Sunday off, and so we try to visit churches when we do that. And I told Brother Pratt, I, we're just going to come by and be with you. He said, I really need you to preach this morning. And I want to tell you this morning, I have never been more full of the Word than I am this morning. So I hope you come to get it, because I come to bring it this morning. I'm excited about what God's doing in the state of Arizona. And this week, it, it's, it's really been an incredible week. Um, we, we are living in a time of global crises like never before. And literally turning on the news, we are now in a con literally in a crisis back in the Middle East with Iran. We've got earthquakes happening. We've got volcanoes going off. We've got commercial airliners being shot down by surface-to-air missiles. We've got many, many problems, but only one solution, and that solution is Jesus Christ. And... <laughs> Let's give God praise this morning. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. And if you'll just remain standing briefly for the reading of the Word. I, um, I'm very, very aware and very conscious of the time that we're living in this week. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've turned on the news, if you've listened to the radio, if... If you've been aware of what's going on in our world at all, one thing that we all can find common ground in is that there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. And like never before has God called the church to be the church that he's called us to be. We are living in a time of global crises. And what this world needs in a time of global crises is an anointed church a church in revival, a church that can bring deliverance to the hurting. Pastor Pratt just about preached my message for me this morning because you may be here and you may be in a crisis and you may be in a storm. God loves each and every one of you so much that if you'd been the only person on the face of the earth, he would have still sent his son to die for you. And regardless of where you come from, I want you to know this morning, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter who your mama, who your daddy was, what your nationality is. It doesn't matter if you were born as a result of a wild night out on the town conceived by a father that you never met. The fact you are in this building this morning breathing the breath of life into your lungs means God has a plan and an agenda for your life. And I want you to hear me this morning before I get into this. He loves you so much that he wants you to know the truth. Sometimes when we preach the truth, people feel like, well, we're being hard. We're being aggressive. But ladies and gentlemen, I've got three boys here that I would lay my life down for. If they needed a heart, I would give them mine. I'd die for them today. And I love them so much that if I see them involved in something that's destructive to them, I'm going to do everything in my power to tell them the truth, to bring them out of that, even if it seems right unto them. For the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto man. But in the end it leads to destruction. And so I say all that to say this this morning. I want you to know my heart. And I want you to know how much I love you. But I love you enough that I'm going to tell you the truth this morning. Okay? I'm going to read in the book of Ruth. Starting in Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to be reading two verses of scripture. Ruth chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. 
Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Look at your neighbor and tell them there's bread in the house this morning. And y'all going to have to forgive me. We've been fasting about a week now on this 21-day fast leading up to prayer conference. And I don't know what it is about fasting. But brother, it brings it out of you when you preach the gospel. Verse 7, wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was. And her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. I want to talk to you about the storms this morning. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people this morning and to preach this word. God, I'm asking you this morning that first and foremost that you would let this word be communicated in the heart in which I'm giving it. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would not only anoint me to deliver it, but anoint your people to receive it. Father, it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's only by your spirit, says the Lord. And this morning, Father, I'm asking you to anoint me in spite of me, in spite of my flesh, in spite of my past, in spite of all those things that make me human. Anoint me to deliver, thus saith the Lord. Not only anoint me to deliver, but anoint your people to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise as you're seated this morning. Again, it's an honor to be here. Pastor Pratt, thank you for this opportunity. I love him and his wife. They're not only great leaders in this church, they are great leaders in our state. And he serves as one of our district overseers. He serves on our state council. And, and I just want to share this. This church has been so supportive of everything that we do. And I want to thank you for that. We do have Winterfest coming up. Man, it's going to be life-changing, I promise you. The teenagers you send us will not be the teenagers that are going to come back home after this event. So thank you so much, Pastor, for your help with that. And I, I, I want to get right into it this morning. I want to talk to you on these storms, maybe a subtitle, if you will, the perfect storm. And when, when you start talking about this, it really strikes concern in your ear. Because this is what this suggests. It suggests some rare occurrence, a rare meteor, meteorological event in which certain weather patterns come together in just the right way to birth this type of storm. Another term for this perfect storm might be the storm of the century. And it is a very rare occurrence because things have to come together. The conditions have to align in just the right way, in just the right time in order for this type of storm to be birthed. And, and what heightens the concern even the more is that this storm could come in ways we've not anticipated before that it would not necessarily be detected by Doppler radar, that it could simply be just honest before we know it, cause an inconceivable amount of destruction and possibly kill thousands of people in the process. And because of this, our government has formed the NWS or the National Weather Service to increase warning times in the event of these natural disasters. But I want to challenge you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning as we look to the skies in the natural there is a storm that is coming not only in the natural but in the supernatural. The conditions are coming together and storm clouds are gathering. We are living in a time where the weather is uncertain. Pastor Pratt already said he just about froze to death when he walked out of his house this morning. Right now in the south they are experiencing a rare tornado outbreak. We have other places that are experiencing snow this morning. Abnormal heat waves. We have earthquakes that are happening around the world. A volcano is now starting to go off. We've got hailstones falling from the sky the size of softballs and I don't have time this morning to talk to you about the hurricane threat that exists now more than ever before aimed down at the panhandle of Florida and the southeast United States and I want you to understand something this morning I want you to understand that the natural is only a mirror to the supernatural there is a storm that is coming to the church and that storm has intensified and, and the way that our government has decided to deal with these natural disasters is much the same way our government deals with foreign affairs at the United Nations. And that is to downplay it in the sight of the public to reduce the panic level. And one of the ways they do this is by giving these storms friendly names like Katrina or Rita or Charlie. I mean, I think there was one here a while back 
named Francis. I mean, think about it. Everybody run for your life. Here comes Francis. I mean, some of y'all, when I said Francis, it really did. You make makes you nervous because you know a Francis that is coming on like a hurricane. Listen, when I think about Charlie, I think about this little boy that I went to middle school with, and even though he had a big mouth and an attitude to match, he weighed about 80 pounds soaking wet with gravel in his pockets. You could dress him up for Halloween by putting a nickel on top of his head and sending him out as a nail. Wasn't nobody scared of Charlie. But listen, I think if they really want to get the public's attention, I think they just need to be honest and identify that thing for what it is. I think they ought to call it Hurricane Destructicon. Can you imagine Jim Cantori on the Weather Channel? Hurricane Destructicon will be making landfall in two hours and 45 minutes. All residents of Broward and Charlotte County are encouraged to evacuate at this time. Listen, they wouldn't be begging folks to evacuate. There would be a mass Exodus. There wouldn't be none of this. I'm going to ride out the storm. You'd be getting your mama, your sister, and, and big mama for that matter, and saying, I'm getting out of here because Destructicon's coming and I'm not going to be here for this. As it is in the natural, so it is in the supernatural. Storm clouds are gathering under the friendly name of Islam. Storm clouds are gathering under the friendly name of methadone clinics. Storm clouds are gathering under the friendly name of same sex marriage. Clouds called state run lotteries. The enemy is aligning the elements. He's bringing the conditions together as innocent as they may seem to converge in preparation for his most perfect attack. Paul said for we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We understand this attack is too subtle and sinister to be man made but it must be ladies and gentlemen and it is the carefully calculated attack of the spirit of antichrist. And so Something is beginning to happen as the storm begins to rage. People are flocking to the church. I, I wish you'd look around in here. It ain't been that long since I've been here and I see all kinds of new faces in here today. Can I tell you we are seeing people come to our churches who have never come to the church before. They're not coming for the music. They're not coming for the building. They're not coming for a program, but they're coming for shelter in the time of the storm. I'll never forget, ladies and gentlemen, the year is 2004. It is September, and my wife is extremely pregnant with that real tall dude sitting there in the blue shirt. It, I don't know about you, about your guys, but when my wife was like real pregnant, can't sleep comfortable pregnant, want to eat all kind of crazy stuff pregnant, man, I had to be on my toes, and I had to be ready for anything. So I'm, I'm trying to like cater to my wife and what I don't realize is something is getting ready to happen that's going to change my whole church and my whole ministry. There was this girl that stepped in named Katrina in New Orleans and it tore the whole place up. And I'll never forget, Pastor, I just got done preaching on a Sunday night like I normally did. I went home, had some decaf coffee, sat down on the couch, wore out, I did two services that day. And I turned on the TV and I saw this monster storm Katrina about to make landfall in New Orleans. And I had no idea how that was getting ready to change my life. Because I, our church was a Tennessee church, but it was right over the state line in DeSoto, Mississippi. And our county, DeSoto County, was the first county up I-55 that was not directly affected by the storm. I mean, you see all the news about New Orleans and Gulf Shores, but what you don't see is all the destruction up 55, of thousands and thousands of businesses that didn't have power. And so after that storm hit, those hundreds of thousands of refugees evacuees who had lost everything that they had they began to come up I-55 and literally our town turned into a third world country overnight I'll never forget getting a phone call from the secretary at our church it's about 7 30 in the morning she said pastor have you been to the church yet I said I haven't got there yet she said you got to get here and I, I said what's going on she said we do not have an open place in the parking lot the church is full of evacuees and Abigail and I we got out we drove down the road in our van people walking up 
down the road. I couldn't even get a parking place at the church. And our church was a large church. We had a church that would seat about 500. We had a large parking lot, and it was completely full of evacuees. And so I did what any young Pentecostal evangelical pastor with a big vision would do. I shut down the whole operation of our church, and I opened up a hurricane evacuation shelter. We were offering free meals to the people. They were literally living in the classrooms of our church. Trinity Baptist Church did the same. The Goodman Oaks Methodist Church did the same. And so we were responding to this crisis. And I'll never forget, I got a phone call that said it was a restricted number. And I answered the phone, and it was the director of FEMA for that region of the United States of America. And the director of FEMA called and he said, Pastor, we're here, we're in town with officials from the White House and we would like to come meet with you in your office concerning this shelter and, your, and, and what, what, what's happened. So my staff comes in, here comes these directors from FEMA. They sat down and they said, on behalf of the president, George Bush, we want to say thank you that the church has responded the way it has in the event of this national crisis. But as you know, Congress has just allocated millions of dollars in aid for these evacuees. But the only way to get the money is they have to be in our shelters. We have one set up at the YMCA and the Red cross is there. We have another one set up at Walmart and the Red Cross is there as well. Would you kindly close down your shelter and send the evacuees our way? Well, obviously that day we told him that we could not do that and the reason that we couldn't do that is because those evacuees were getting saved, sanctified, and baptized in the Holy Ghost right there at our church. And so seven days later, when the first lady of the United States of America, Laura Bush, came to town to see the evacuees, she didn't get to go to Walmart to visit them, but she had to come to the church to see them. And the reason they were running to the church is because it was the time of the storm. They weren't going to Walmart, even though the Red Cross was at Walmart. They weren't going to the YMCA, even though the Red Cross was at the YMCA, but they were running to the church. And the reason they were running to the church is because there is a resident anointing in this church that cannot be found anywhere else. Isaiah declared that in that day his burden shall be taken off of thy shoulders and his yoke from off of thy neck and every yoke shall be broken because of the anointing every yoke of addiction every yoke of depression every yoke of poverty every yoke of alcoholism every yoke of heroin and I've come to tell you this morning the anointing that God's placed on this church is strong enough to break the bondage that the devil's storming over this city I wish somebody would praise him in this house this morning. I've come to tell somebody that the anointing that you have received from him abideth in you. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm anointed this morning. I'm anointed. I'm anointed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I am anointed for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. What am I saying this morning? I'm saying let the storm clouds come, but preach the gospel. Let the rain fall, but preach the gospel. Let Islam threaten the world, but preach the gospel. Let Planned Parenthood march on Washington, but preach the gospel. Let the devil take his best shot, but preach the gospel, and they shall hear the truth, and the truth shall make them free. I feel liberty in this house this morning. Naomi finds herself in a devastating situation. A storm has come. First, it was a famine that drove her out of Judah. And then a little bit later, her husband died. And then a little bit later, her son died. And then a little bit later, her other son died. Internal and external forces, the conditions came together upon her at one time. It was the perfect storm. She never saw it coming. For you see... The perfect storm is always an unexpected storm. Oh, you don't have to watch out for the storms you expect this morning. 
You've got to watch out for the ones you don't expect. The reason you've got to watch out for unexpected storms, ladies and gentlemen, is because it is a sign of spiritual warfare. Because, see, when you started out into it, you didn't think you are going to have any problems. You didn't think you are going to have any trouble. You didn't think you are going to have any issues, and then out of nowhere came strange, unforeseeable, unperceivable storms. And it is a sign that the enemy knows that you are on the verge of something big. Oh, trust me when I tell you that the perfect storm can announce to you that God's getting ready to use you for his glory. The storm can announce to you that God's getting ready to do something incredible in your life. And you can't let the storm stop you. Look at your neighbor and say, don't let the storm stop you. You see, when you know God's got something for you on the other side you got to keep on sailing even though the winds may blow and the waves may crash you got to keep on sailing even though the rain may fall and the lightning may roll you got to keep on sailing and, and I know some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about because you ain't never been through nothing but there's some people in here this morning that been through some real storms that if it had not been for the saving miracle walking blood washing power of Jesus you wouldn't even be here Oh, I know some of y'all can't praise him right now because you got to act like you don't know what I'm talking about. But I wish I could find me some people that God had delivered from a storm or time or two that would help me give God a little bit of praise. I'm not talking about ordinary storms. I'm not talking about I'm in a storm this month and I can't pay my cell phone bill. Can I preach? I'm not talking about I'm in a storm because I done used my bill money to get my hair and my nails done. I'm talking about people who all hell's breaking loose. And storm clouds are coming in on every side. If it's not this, it's that. If it's not that, it's the other. If it's not the other, it's something else. Hell hounds are at your back door. The devil's standing in your window. And you're saying, Lord, this just don't make any sense. Why am I going through all this? Why am I going through all that? Well, I've come all the way here this morning to tell you why. And it's because just like Naomi, God's getting ready to use you like you've never been used before I've come to tell somebody the fact the enemy has sent a host of demons to encamp around you is an indication honey he knows who he's fooling with there was a scripture up here earlier that said the enemy comes to steal to kill and destroy now if me and my buddy Hal we're going to be burglars and robbers we're not, we're not going to rob people that are broke that's why somebody can walk down the road who's homeless and they don't have anything. Nobody messes with them. But somebody with a high-end car, they got to put an alarm system on it because you don't rob broke people. And the fact the enemies come against you the way he has is an indication, honey. You got something that he wants. You got something to work with down on the inside of you is a gift and an anointing that God has placed there. The fact that he has sent a host of demons to encamp around you is an indication he knows who he's fooling with. In other words, your storm ought to tell you who you are. Oh yeah, because see, if you wasn't somebody in the kingdom, you wouldn't have all this mess all around you all the time. Trouble with the kids, trouble on the home, trouble with the job, trouble at the church. It's just that the enemy's afraid you're getting ready to shake yourself loose. And he knows if you ever get loose, everything connected to you is going to get loose too. Your children are going to get loose. Your ministry's going to get loose. Your family's going to get loose. Hear me this morning. We are defined opposition oh yeah oh I, I know that we like to come in here and clap our hands and dance in the presence of the Lord and I do it and there's nothing wrong with that and, 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 and we only thank God is with us when we can give him praise and things are going good but let me remind you that even though the word says that God inhabits the praises of his people he visits the praises of his people. But if you want to know where God lives, he lives in the storm. He lives in trouble. For the Bible says he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. We are defined by our opposition. I've never gone through anything that I didn't come out of it better than I went in it. It educated me. 
and it educated me through my enemies. See, my enemies taught me more about me than my friends ever did. Is there anybody here besides me that's ever had some real haters out there? Don't worry. Hang on, because you will. And let me encourage you with this. With new levels come new devils. And the more God uses you, the more God elevates you, the more you trust Him and the more He puts favor on you, the more enemies you're going to have. Some of y'all are here thinking, I must be doing something wrong because everybody hates me. I've come to tell you doing something right. Because he wouldn't be fighting you the way he was fighting you if he wasn't intimidated by something that you're doing. You see, my friends, they tried to rescue me from my storm. My friends handed me an umbrella. But you see, my enemies pushed me into my storm. And so ultimately, it was my enemies that taught me how to pray. It was my enemies that taught me how to fast. It was my enemies that taught me how to worship. It was my enemies that taught me that my God is more than enough. He shall supply all my needs. He is my El Shaddai. Can we take just a few minutes and praise God for our enemies in here this morning? He said, I will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. And if you got an enemy right now that's trying to take you out, I dare you to lift up your hands and give God praise. You see, God will use the persecution that your storm brings against you to redirect you into your next move. And, and some of you are here this morning and you're upset because a storm hit your job. And they told you they had to let you go. But I've come to tell you that this time next year, you're going to be saying, I'm glad they let me go. Because if they hadn't let me go, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Can I go deeper? There's some ladies in here this morning that you need to tell your ex-husband, I want to thank you for walking out on me. I, I want to thank you for leaving me to raise these two babies by myself and work three jobs because if you hadn't have walked out on me, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. And I hadn't left the fellas out. Some of you fellas need to go find your old ex-girlfriend and say, I want to thank you for breaking my heart. Because if you hadn't have broke my heart, I wouldn't know what a real Holy Ghost field woman was. Oh, I've come to tell you this morning that the things you're crying about now, you're going to be shouting about it later. And right now you're crying because they slammed the door in your face. But this time next year, you're going to be dancing in the door saying, look at what the Lord has done. Listen, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but if you got an ounce of faith at all, lift your eyes to the hills from which cometh your help. Open up your mouth and declare that this is the day that the Lord hath made. And I will rejoice so Naomi and I'm moving quickly Naomi is misplaced and misallocated searching for answers looking for direction looking for a solution at the end of the storm. Can I tell you greater than the storm that happened to you is how it leaves you? Greater than the storm that happened to you is how it leaves you. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, literally thousands were dead. And it's hard to articulate into words what that really was unless you lived it. You see what you see on the news, but ladies and gentlemen, you cannot imagine how bad that was. Did you know there are people to this day that are still living in FEMA trailers down there? To this day. And greater than the storm that happened is the aftermath that it left. This was the same thing that happened on September the 11th. Oh, this storm wasn't the result of some tornado or hurricane, but it was the result of evil, hateful, terroristic debauchery. And more than how what happened to those towers and the Pentagon and Flight 93 is the state of fear that it left us in. And so now we live in this 
post 9-11 world where we feel vulnerable in a place that we've never felt vulnerable before. So what do we do? Do we pack it up? Do we quit? Do we just throw in the towel? Do we live our life in fear? The devil is a liar. And I've come to tell you that I refuse to live my life in fear. As long as they're flying, I'm going. If I can't get in a plane, I'm going to get in a car. If I can't get in a car, I'm going to get and a bicycle to go down the road because I got things to do. I got people to see. I got a kingdom to build and the devil is a liar. I refuse to stand here this morning with my saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost self and let the devil lock me up in fear in the closet in my own house. If God gave me the house, I'm going all through the house. I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to drive down the road and yeah, a drunk driver might get me but if I die, I'm going to die rolling because God has not given me a spirit of fear but power, love, and a sound mind. Hear me. I have seen families give up in the aftermath of a storm brought about by the reckless actions of a drunk driver. I've seen marriages give up in the aftermath of a storm brought about by the loss of a child. I've seen pastors give up in the aftermath of the storm brought about by a ministry that would not seem to grow. But the devil is a liar. That devil that told you that where you are this morning in the aftermath of your storm is as far as you're ever going to get is a lying spirit from the lake of fire and you need to shake it off this morning. This word declares that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. I've come to tell you this morning that down on the inside of you are gifts and callings and talents that may have been pressed down, that may have been crushed and because of the storm that happened to you it may have left left you displaced and misallocated but arise my brothers and sisters whatever the storm did obviously it didn't finish the job because the fact that you are in this sanctuary this morning breathing the breath of life into your lungs means you're not dead yet God's not done with you yet arise and use what's left listen God won't use what you lost he's going to use what you got left He's going to use the meal in your barrel. He's going to use the pot of oil in your kitchen. Arise and seize what's left. Who cares, Naomi, if all you got left is a daughter-in-law named Ruth? Use what's left. Who cares if all you got's the clothes on your back? Use what's left. Who cares if all you got's an EBT card? Use what's left. Who cares if you don't feel your joy anymore? Use what's left. Who cares if your anointing's almost gone? Take what you got left and be what God said you could be. Your miracle isn't in what you lost. Your miracle isn't what you got left. And so there are some this morning, and I'm going to ask the piano to come back and just start playing softly. i got to get some land and music here. And because of some who have been through horrific storms in life, they have found themselves like the man who fell among thieves, beaten and broken, found by the good Samaritan laying beside of the road, half dead. Can, can, can I be transparent with you this morning? The, the perfect storm hit our family in 1998. I'll never forget it because then me and my girlfriend, Abigail Fulbright, who is now Abigail Hughes, were at an intramural softball game. We were, we were Lee students. We came back to my apartment. And when we came in, there was a red light flashing. Because, you know, back then you had answer machines. They didn't have all this voicemail on cell phones. I'm starting to feel old. We pushed the button, and it was the voice of Abigail's sister, and you could hear the panic in her voice. And this is what she said. She said, our father, who, who at that time was serving as a state overseer of Alabama he was doing mission rallies and he was up preaching to a congregation about like this one when all of a sudden his words begin to slur and that night he would suffer a massive cerebral brain hemorrhage he would never talk again he would be bed fast for the rest of his life which would only be about four years after that event only to waste away and ultimately die. 
And I'm just going to tell you, there were some times that we gathered around his bed and we said, Lord, why? Why do these things happen? Why do these things take place? People say, well, you're not supposed to question God. Let me tell you something. You've never had a ministry cut short. You've never had a child on drugs. It's in those times, little cliches and little one-liners, it don't cut it. And when my father-in-law had his brain hemorrhage, he was totally paralyzed on the right side of his body. But ladies and gentlemen, that didn't stop him from praising the name of the Lord. Because when you would go in his room, we'd start talking about what God was doing in world missions. We'd start talking about what God was doing in youth and discipleship and around the world in her church. We would begin to pray and he would get his praise on. And I, and I want you to know that this was such, it was a huge deal when this happened to him because you had to really know him to appreciate him, but he would praise God anywhere. I told people he had praised God in Walmart between the chicken wings and the frozen carrots. He didn't care where he was. He'd lift up the name of the Lord. And even in sickness, even in paralysis, even in crises, he still knew how to praise the Lord. And this is what he would do. He would take his legs Left. He took his left arm, the arm that still worked. He'd reach over and grab his right, lift it up over his head, and give God praise. He was bad, fast, and paralyzed. He had one foot in the grave, but he still knew how to call on the name of the Lord. What am I saying this morning? I'm saying you may be half dead financially. You may be half dead emotionally. You may be half dead spiritually. But I dare you in the name of Jesus to take the half that still works lift it up and give God praise and if you can give God praise for half I've come to tell you that weeping may endure for a night but joy is coming in the morning and in conclusion in Ruth chapter 1 verse 7 I got to talk to you about praise God said he brought them back to the land of Judah look at somebody and say Judah Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, there's something to gain by our return to Judah. In the aftermath of the storm, God was calling them back to Judah. You see, in the Bible, when the baby was born, she said, I'm going to name this one Judah, which means we shall praise the Lord. In the Bible, the word Judah means praise. What am I saying? I'm saying in the aftermath of the storm, God was calling them back to praise. And I want to tell you why. Praise won't let you lay down. Praise will make you get back up. And that's why the devil's mad at you this morning because the Bible said he fell from heaven like a bolt of lightning, but he never got back up. I dare you look at somebody and tell them, I'm back this morning. I've been through a storm, I've been through depression, I've had issues, but I'm back. And that's why the devil's upset, because he didn't think you'd make it back. Naomi, he thought you'd lay down in Moab, roll over and curse God and die. That's why every time you stand up on your own two feet, lift up your hands and open up your mouth and give God the praise, it breaks the back of the enemy. So why does it make the devil mad when we praise the Lord? Because the Bible said in heaven, Lucifer was the worship leader. We know about Michael, the archangel. We know about Gabriel, the angel that was the messenger. But you know there was another one named Lucifer, the son of the morning. And in heaven, he was the worship leader. But when he got sideways and he fell, God pulled a president, Donald Trump, on him, yanked him in the boardroom and said, you're fired, and he lost his job. When I got saved and I came to Jesus, I got washed in the blood and I applied for the position and I got the job. And every time I lift up my hands and give God praise. See, that's why the devil's mad at you this morning. It's because you stole his job. If you want to make somebody real mad, steal their job. Listen, I don't know about you this morning, but I have come into this place this morning. I've come to work this morning. Let me do my job. It's my job to praise him. It's my job to magnify him. It's my job to lift him up. Listen, i got to praise him. I don't care if you laugh at me. 
stare at me, roll your eyes, or call me a fool when I look back from where he's brought me from and I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. Oh, listen, if you'd have saw where he brought me from, you'd praise him too. If you'd have saw how there was a hurricane from hell that was blowing my house apart and I barely made it out. I mean, I blew my socks off jumping out the window, but I made it by the grace of God. Excuse me if I dance in your sanctuary and run in the parking lot because there's a story behind Judah. There's a story behind my praise. There's a sacrifice behind my praise. Stand with me. I'm going to stop. I'm going to give you this and I'm quitting. Ruth chapter 1 verse 22. He brought Naomi back. But he didn't bring her back alone. The one daughter-in-law that stayed with her. A young lady by the name of Ruth. Ruth who was a Moabitess. Who in that country was a foreigner. She wasn't like them. She didn't look like them. Look down upon. Oh, but we serve a God that can use the least likely to do the Almighty because His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Quickly, I know y'all probably don't watch movies. I do. I love to watch movies. And we changed it in the teaching so we can do that now. And I was watching one the other day. I know probably none of y'all have ever seen it, but it was in that movie. God gave me probably the most supernatural revelation I've ever had. How many of y'all know that God can really use the foolish to confound the wise? And God spoke to me through that, and it wasn't even a color movie. It was a black and white movie. It was the original Wizard of Oz. I mean the Judy Garland version. And I was watching that show, and as I'm watching this movie, I am introduced to this beautiful girl by the name of Dorothy. Now, Dorothy's got it going on. She's got a beautiful voice. She's got a little dog named Toto. And every time life throws her a curveball, she just calls a timeout. She starts to sing a pretty little song until everything pops back together perfect again. You need to try that sometime. Next time you're out here and you get pulled over for speeding and the officer comes to your window and says license and registration, you just need to start singing somewhere over the rainbow. Listen, they may think you're about five fries short of Happy Meal, but if it gets you out of a ticket, who cares, right? But you see, ladies and gentlemen, there came a day that even Dorothy got in a jam she couldn't sing her way out of. For there came a great wind, a great tornado. It was the perfect storm that swept Dorothy, her little dog Toto, and her whole house out of Kansas into a strange land. When Dorothy steps out of the wreckage of what is left of her home, <clears throat> she steps out of the wreckage in the aftermath of the storm where she is confronted and introduced to this cute little race of people called the Munchkins. Now the Munchkins are about three foot tall and they weigh about 350 pounds each. And they are a cute little race of people. They know how to have a party. They know how to have a parade. They know how to celebrate and have a good time. In fact, they all belong to this fraternity called the Lollipop Guild. But I've come to tell you as much as you love the Munchkins and as lovable as they are, can I tell you the Munchkins are bums. Look at your neighbor and tell them the Munchkins are bums. The munchkins are bums. And the reason <clears throat> that the munchkins are bums is because when it got time for Dorothy to leave and go to the Emerald City, you know, down the yellow brick road, none of the munchkins went with her. They sent her all by her young self. Anybody besides me ever had any friends like that? Oh, I mean the moment the light's on you and the attention is on you, and you got the money and the party's going, they're your friends, but the moment the storm comes, and the moment push comes to shove, they're nowhere to be found. But I want you to know it wasn't the cute, lovable munchkins that helped Dorothy accomplish her mission. It was a bunch of misfits. It was a bunch of strays. As a matter of fact, in order for Dorothy to get to where she was going, she had to have the help from someone who didn't have a brain. Somebody else that didn't have a heart. And somebody else that was a coward. 
And this is what the Lord told me. He said, Shay, in order for Dorothy to get to where she was going, she had to have the help from someone who was mentally challenged, someone who was physically challenged, and someone else that was struggling with their past. Can I tell you this morning, God's getting ready to do something in this church of God. You see, the people that we thought God was going to use, that were going to be here to help us build their church, they're nowhere to be found. While at the same time, people who thought God could never use them, we're going to be right in fellowship with. Oh, I've come to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that we're also bound for an emerald city where one of these days we're going to walk on a yellow brick road made of gold. But until we get there, we're going to have to have some help. And I've come to tell you that God is sending help from the most unusual places. We got help coming from the crack houses. We got help coming from the bars. We got help coming from the methadone labs. Listen, I've come to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that that next great voice of evangelism, the next great pastor in America, he's not preaching behind a pulpit this morning. He's dealing crack on a street corner, probably in Phoenix, and God's got a plan for his life, and he don't know about it yet. That next great female voice, she's not standing behind a pulpit today. She's selling her body to feed a dope habit and five babies at home. And God's got a plan for her life and she don't know about it yet. That next worship group, the next Jesus culture, the next Hill song, they're not going to be made up of professional musicians and Grammy-nominated singers, but they're going to be made up of ex-convicts and junkies because God's favorite song of all is the song of the redeemed, of those who have been washed in the blood, who lift their voice and sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound who saved a wretch like me. I've come to tell you this morning, ready or not, here they come. They're coming for shelter in the time of the storm. They may not look like you. They may not smell like you, but I thank God I serve a God that He loves to use use goods and I've come to tell this church he's about to send some crippled reinforcements God is sending in a wounded congregation don't quit don't get discouraged don't throw in the towel don't give up Naomi God's got a Ruth and she's getting ready to have a baby Ruth 4 and 13 and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son can I tell you ladies and gentlemen the perfect storm it's just the perfect opportunity because what the enemy meant for bad God's going to turn it around and use it for good and the storm God has sent to destroy this generation all it's done is bring them back to Judah it's bringing them back to the church it's bringing them back to the house of bread and when they get here they're going to start birthing ministries they're going to start birthing miracles and when you fill this place up and your pastor preaches the gospel it's going to send a generation into spiritual labor and they're going to bring forth gifts and talents that they never knew that they had and I've come to say something to the older generation we can't do it without you and I know right now the enemy's trying to pit one generation against the other but this is what God told me in this scripture Ruth has the baby but brother Don Faulkner we don't know why but we know this for whatever reason Ruth could not nurse her own baby who nursed the baby Naomi wasn't even her baby but she's nursing a baby that she didn't even have can I I just be real she's nursing a baby out of menopause she has moved past that time in her life feeling like the worst has happened and on the inside she's all dried up and all of a sudden God's making something flow out of her that hasn't flowed out of her in a long, long time. What am I saying? I'm saying I don't care how late it looks. I don't care how impossible it may seem. I don't care if the devil told you it would never happen. And just when you thought he was right, God made the anointing flow out of you. One more time.